Hello and welcome everyone to the 10th period of the Bill of Rights Institute's bi-weekly webinar series. My name is Kirk Higgins. I'm the Senior Manager for Curriculum here at the Bill of Rights Institute. I've been here for five years and it's my privilege to be able to develop the content and curriculum that the Bill of Rights Institute develops. And my name is Rachel Davison Humphreys. I'm the Director of Outreach here at the Institute. And prior to that, I was in the classroom for about eight years, uh, working with students around the country on many of the ideas that we present here at 10th period. And today we are honored to welcome with us John Tinker, uh, who's joining us remotely. And uh, we're excited to have you, John. Thanks. Uh, thank you very much for inviting me. I'm, I'm happy to be with you. John is a man who needs little introduction. <laughs> uh, but uh, just to set the stage for what we're hoping to cover today, our goals um, are really to discuss the landmark Supreme Court case of Tinker v. Des Moines. Uh, what we really want to do with that is learn about John's experience um, and what it was like to be a part of that momentous case, um, and also to discuss the long arm of that decision and how it's impacted conversations about free speech um, and continues to do so today, um, and really to also grapple with the idea of how uh, we can talk about free speech in the classroom, its importance, um, and how to really encourage um, students to, to use their voice and to use the free speech rights that they have um, to do good in their schools and their communities. Uh, I'd like to remind everyone that throughout the conversation today, there's a Q&A box. Uh, we'd encourage you to submit any questions that you have for John or for us, um, and we will answer those um, at the end of the, the webinar series. We'll save about 15 to 20 minutes to, to answer just your questions. So please, throughout the conversation, um, ask any question that you have. Um, but with that, um, John, many people are familiar with your case, uh, but for those who are less familiar, could you provide a, a summary for us? Uh, sure. In, uh, in late 1965, um, some of us uh, students uh, were very concerned about the war in Vietnam, the, the death and destruction that was going on, and uh, we were deeply moved by that. And so we decided to wear black armbands to indicate our, our feelings about the war. And the, the school administration uh, prohibited the armbands. When they found out that we were going to wear them, they prohibited it. And so uh, we, we wore them anyway and got kicked out of school. And so we sued the school board uh, in the federal court for violating our First Amendment rights. And we lost at the district court. We appealed to the circuit court in St. Louis and they split four to four. And so we appealed it to the Supreme Court. And at the Supreme Court, we won uh, seven to two. So it was a pretty strong decision in our favor at the Supreme Court. And the, the court, uh, um, Abe Fortas, the justice who wrote the majority opinion, uh, declared that neither students nor teachers shed their First Amendment rights at the schoolhouse gate. Now, that was an important decision. And, and those words ring in uh, <laughs> these days. So how did you, that's, that's a wonderful overview, but how did you become the John Tinker of Tinker v. Des Moines? How did, how did you get to that moment when you, and I guess it was a group of friends, can you speak more about that, about the origins of your story? Well, I grew up in a family of activists, in a sense. My parents were both uh, strong civil rights activists, and uh, my father was a Methodist minister, uh, he, uh, he believed in a position that they sometimes call the social gospel, uh, concern for other people mostly. And uh, my parents had witnessed uh, World War II as young adults. They were very much anti-war. And when the Vietnam War uh, started to develop, uh, us children in the family also picked up that concern. And so that was really the basis of, of how myself and my sister Mary Beth, uh, and actually our younger siblings too, uh, became involved in the wearing of the armbands. When you say that they were involved in the civil rights movement, can you tell us a little bit more about that early history? Sure. Um, my father was a, a Methodist minister, as I said, in a small town in Iowa when I was a young child. And there was uh, one family in town the children of which were not a black family, the kids were not permitted to swim at the public swimming pool. And uh, when my father found out about that, he, he took it up with the, with the town council 
And the uh, church where he was serving as pastor was upset by that. They didn't want to have that type of controversy in the town. And so they didn't renew um, our father's contract. And so uh, he had an appointment in the church in Des Moines, Iowa. And uh, we also, uh, we invited our black friends, us kids in the family, invited uh, our black friends to come to that church. And that church also didn't want to have black people in the church. And so they also didn't renew his contract. Um, at that point, our father, uh, had became employed by a Quaker organization called the American Friends Service Committee. And his job title was Peace Education Secretary. And his job was to uh, bring speakers about world affairs um, into, uh, into Iowa and, and the surrounding states. And so uh, we kids had access to quite a bit of information about the war that, that was not coming from the network news or the AP or the UPI. And, and so it was natural in our family to be opposed to the war. And it was also natural to do something about it when we, we felt the, the prick of conscience about it. That's, that's a great story, John. And, and it's, it's so incredible that you were able to, to feel that prick and take a step forward because it can be such a difficult thing to do, um, and it, is. Now, it can be. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and looking back now at how momentous this case has become, did you have an idea when you were putting on that armband and going off to school that it would develop uh, into the case that it is, or that it would garner the attention that it has? Not the faintest idea. No idea at all. Uh, our concern was about the war, and. Uh, the First Amendment, I, I grew up in the public school system in Iowa, and we were taught to believe in the First Amendment. And I grew up assuming that the First Amendment applied and that uh, I had a right to say what I thought. I, I understood that I didn't have the right to disrupt the school, but I did feel that I had the right as an American to speak my mind and to let people know what I thought. But no, we, we had no idea at all, first, that it would turn into a First Amendment case, and second, that that case would grow to be what it has become in the following 50 years. This month is actually the 50th anniversary of the decision in the case. Yeah, that's right. And uh, the Bill of Rights Institute is actually going to be uh, having a contest uh, that we would like to encourage um, everyone to participate in uh, at uh, hashtag honor tinker 50 on February 25th. Um, any teachers who are out there uh, who are teaching about the tinker case um, on the anniversary, we encourage you to, to tweet at us um, and, and share it. across all the platforms. Across the ways all the platforms. You're integrating these ideas um, and the continuing uh, long arm their importance in, into your classrooms with your students today. So, again, that's hashtag tinker honor tinker 50 five zero. Yep. Yeah. Oh, that's so, true. That's wonderful. Yeah. Um, so how, so tell us what happened since, how has that early experience on the national stage impacted your life? What, what, what's been, what's been the, ex your, your life experience since then? Well, <laughs> it's been quite, quite an experience for me. Um, it's hard for me to, to compare A against B because I only experienced the life I've led. Um, in a sense, I, I felt like I'd already made my mark at, at a young age, but at the same time, I felt like I'd better do something else because, or uh, this will be the only thing that I've done. Um, so I, uh, I was very much an anti-war activist, a peace activist, and, and the war, of course, uh, continued for some time after we wore the armbands. Um, I attended the University of Iowa, but to be honest, I couldn't really keep my mind on my studies. I was, uh, I was part of the large demonstrations against the war in Iowa City. Um, I dropped out of school, out of the university. I actually dropped out twice. I, I tried to get back into it, and I just could not keep my mind on that. The, the world situation seemed too dire to me, not just the war, but also the pollution 
issue and the the particularly the the nuclear pollution was a big concern for me i uh, i moved into a 1941 ford delivery van and i lived in uh in a woods owned by some friends of of my parents actually uh north of iowa city and i kind of had my henry david thoreau experience there which i i i loved it i i honestly loved it uh and it gave me quite a, a worldview on what is necessary and what is kind of extra in, in life and in our pursuits. Uh, I remember our lawyer came out to visit me one day in the, in the truck, and I was living in the truck. I had a beard and long hair. I was kind of a hippie. And he was coming out, Dan Johnston was coming out to talk to the law school in Iowa City, and he drove out to see me and his car got stuck <laughs> out in the woods in this dirt track. And so <laughs> it just kind of summed up, there he was in his tie and his suit and, and so on, and coming to visit me, a hermit, basically, in, in the woods. <laughs> and anyway, anyway, that, uh, that one thing led to another. I, I lived in the uh, old stone barn in Stone City, Iowa, that was owned by the inventor of the trampoline. And so I, uh, I had a personal relationship uh, with him. I was his caretaker, and he'd come out on the weekends, and that was an interesting part of my life. I, uh, I moved into uh, an old storefront in a very small town in Iowa. I studied uh, programming. I became a database programmer. I wrote uh, a state database on, uh, on industrial byproducts for the state of Iowa. I, uh, I got uh, into uh, a programming team at a telecommunications company, a large company, and got on that team and did uh, database programming for them. And finally, they, they moved me up to be a database architect for them. And, and this was in no, I had no formal schooling at all. And, uh, and they moved me into that high position. So that was, that was quite an experience. They flew me around the country, gave me an uh, expense paid uh, living situation i flew back and forth to, to san jose california but uh, let's see before that actually i went to nicaragua i had a i had a project in nicaragua to take uh, sewing machines and bicycles and medical equipment i shipped it uh, through a quaker organization in florida so i spent parts of four years in nicaragua um, and since then i um, I lived in a in a small town in Iowa in a in a three thousand dollar building. You wouldn't believe it was worth every penny. It was the roof leaked. The uh, I burned wood for heat. Uh, it was pretty rough. <laughs> but uh, then I got that job doing the database uh, programming. I would I became instantly middle class. Um, I had a good income and. Uh, and then I bought uh, I bought this building that I'm in right now, which is the old uh, the old school building in Fayette, Missouri. It's a beautiful three-story brick school building. Uh, I love it very much. Uh, my wife and I have built uh, a local radio station here. So I'm I'm also I forgot to tell you I was uh, I was a chief engineer at a radio station in Iowa City for a couple of years. So uh, right now I'm the engineer of our community radio station. The roof is on, uh, the, the antenna is on the roof. And, uh, and uh, so we, we have an interesting life here. It sounds like it. It sounds, it sounds to me like you really took your, your principles about justice and about what is, what is right and, and made a life around that. Uh, even today with your with your work in the radio. Can you talk a little bit about that impulse? What what drove uh, you to those decisions? I um, Well, as I said, our father was a Methodist minister. So I grew up with the Christian message. And then to see our father be basically kicked out, out of two churches for living what he considered to be Christian principles uh, it, it gave me a feeling that I it was okay to be independent in my own evaluation of what's going on and what I should do about it. And then when I when I dropped out of school, 
in the early 1970s, I decided that when I dropped out of the university and I, I decided that if I'm going to drop out of school and not get a degree, I'd better get an education. And so at that point, I, I did start educating myself and I, I read very widely, but I I decided that I would try to shoot for the center line of civilization's values. And so I was interested in the ancient values, truth, beauty, justice, and those sorts of things. And so with that as my compass, um, I read, uh, actually, I, I kind of, uh, I read quite a few like Bartlett's quotations, uh, Rodale's Dictionary of Thoughts, collections of wisdom and I tried to find what the center line was and and so I've tried to I, I thought it was a, a better winning decision to, to pick the center line I guess so I've done that but it, it's put me on the edge of various social issues as they come by I, I'm still consider myself very much to be a, a, a peace activist anti-militarism not anti-military people. I, I want to make that clear. I have quite a bit of feeling of sympathy for people in the military, but militarism as a mode of our society, I'm very much opposed to. Anyway, that's that's my worldview, basically, and, and I've just been trying to pursue it. Right, so I think that transitions us nicely into talking about the, the free speech angle, because you still are very much involved in social movements. So what do you see as being the long arm of your, of this social, of, of your, of your, of your case? How have, yeah. how have you seen it play out in your, in the past 50 years? Well, in our case, uh, Justice Abe Fortas, it's, he said for the first time that, that public school students are persons under the law with respect to the First Amendment. And the First Amendment, free speech, all of, all of the elements of the First Amendment, to me, are, are like foundational. They're like the keystone of which you can make a democracy. Basically, we need to be able to share our thoughts with each other. And that's what the First Amendment says. And I'm a, I'm a big believer in democracy, probably because that's the way I was raised in the in the public school system. But by our culture generally, the promotion of democracy, it, it really um, settled in with me. I, I really am a believer. And uh, and so I'm I'm just trying to make it work, basically, I I. I like with the radio station, um, I moved into uh, rural Missouri, and uh, most of the late night talk radio is a little harsh, you know, to my ears. So um, we bring a alternative perspective uh, here, and and uh, we have a community radio station, so we have uh, community participation. We, our county commissioner. Uh, would come in and do uh, weekly weekly shows, what's going on in the county. And uh, my wife uh, does a great job of uh, being in contact with the school system and, and the city officials and so on. So we're trying to help make a community right here in, in rural Missouri. I mean, we, we started out in a community, we're just trying to make it better. Yeah, that's great, John. And uh, again, I'd encourage our audience, if you have any questions for John, uh, please submit them to the Q&A box, and um, we'll tackle those um, here toward the end of the program. But um, when thinking about your, your response, um, I'm curious to get your thoughts on how you see free speech fitting into that idea of community. Um, community is something that we wrangle with a lot here at the Bill of Rights Institute. We consider ourselves a civic organization. We work to provide material that helps teachers engage in civic public conversations um, to help their students to, to grapple with those issues. Um, where do you see free speech fitting into that? And how do you see, particularly the case uh, that you were a part of, Tinker v. Des Moines, um, being a part of that legacy of free speech in the United States? Well, I think it's crucial and central and foundational. And uh, a long time ago, it occurred to me that 
whenever you're afraid to say something that you sincerely think that you really believe, that that fear is kind of like an arrow that can point toward the problem. Because someone who's trying to make you feel afraid to say what you think, you've really identified a major problem there. And since we had been uh, vindicated so strongly by the Supreme Court, I, I felt like I had a, a certain special kind of a mantle had, had fallen on me and, and that it was maybe more important than ever that I not be afraid to say what I think about things. And uh, that I have a, I may be wrong, but I feel like I, I have a certain kind of protection in a, in a sense uh, to say what I think. Uh, and so I feel obligated to, to exercise that. And s since, um, well, the student, like in our case, the, to, to say that students are persons under the law with respect to the First Amendment, that move of um, contribution to the discussion, say our civic discussion, by young people is a really important move because young people, in my view, tend to be idealists in a sense. They, they, they work with ideas. They, um, they don't have the world experience to, uh, to work from experience, so they, they work with ideas. And, and the young people and what they think are, what their ideals are, tells us a lot about our society and what the ideals of society are. And most of the problems that we have in society, I think, come because our ideals have become frustrated for one reason or other. And getting, getting the children, uh, the students, uh, involved in in that civic discussion, I think it brings a lot to the discussion. So I'm I'm really happy to have been uh, part of of the opening up of that civic discussion to students. Yeah, I think that's great and, and exciting. Um, and, and one thing it makes me think about, you know, I often speak my mind here at the office, and it doesn't always go over well. Um, and, and it curious, goes over just fine. <laughs> and I'm curious, you know, I mean, we kind of laugh that off, but if we up on a macro scale, it's the same thing that happens in society. And so I wonder if you could just talk a little bit about what it, what it was like for you, you know, going into the school at first and getting pushed back for wearing the armband, and then what it took for you to continue to be so convicted in what your belief was, kind of what what kinds of things did you have to overcome in order to, to ensure that you, you were staying committed to what you wanted to say? Mm -hmm. Well, when I left, when I left uh, the house that day, I had my armband uh, folded up and in my pocket. I was uh, dressed, uh, I had a white shirt and a tie and a suit coat uh, because I wanted to be kind of formal. Um, but I had my armband in my pocket because I was afraid to wear it on the street. Uh, at that point, it had been in the newspaper and uh, I was fearful, just to put it bluntly, about what somebody might see me on the street and, and might do. But anyway, on the way out the door, my father said, you know, John, I'm not sure you should wear that armband. He said, the school authorities, they have a job to do and they have made the decision not to allow the armbands in the school. And I said, well, Dad, this is just a black piece of cloth, and there are, are people dying every day in Vietnam. And my father, who had witnessed World War II and, and, the, and the, the way that the German nation really had turned its back on on the persecution of the Jews, my father said to me then, he said, then for you, it's a matter of conscience. And, and I said, well, I guess it is. And he said, well, then I support what you're doing because the, the experience of World War II for my father, um, um, it, it, uh, it rose up the concept of conscience as a, as a very significant and important and an important part of being human 
So, so I went to school with the uh, armband in my pocket, and uh, I had orchestra practice. I, I play the violin, and uh, I was really too embarrassed to be seen putting it on. I, it just, it didn't, I was afraid. I, you know, I was nervous, uh, apprehensive, anxious. And so I still didn't have it on by the time I got to homeroom. And after, after homeroom, uh, I went into the bathroom and I was uh, trying to pin it on with one hand, a safety pin, you know, with one hand, and it was difficult. And, and one of the kids that I knew uh, saw me doing it and he helped pin it on. And, and so I, I had it on over my dark uh, suit coat and it didn't really show up very well. And uh, the one teacher that I think really noticed it apparently decided not to say anything about it. I, th I think he really was against the school policy and he didn't say anything. So I, I went to gym class and then I thought, well, nobody's nobody's seen this armband. I'd better make it more visible. So I, I uh, put it back on over my white shirt and I didn't wear my suit coat over it. And so it, it was very visible at that point. And so I, I went to lunch and sat with uh, my normal friends at my normal table. And uh, some of them warned me, you know, you're going to get in trouble. Um, others said, well, I, you know, I support you. And, and some kids came up and started verbally harassing me, uh, calling me a commie and a coward and and so on. And, and one of the football players who I really didn't know, I, I mean, I knew who he was, but we weren't friends. He came up to the table and to the kids that were harassing me, he said, look, you have your opinions about the war. John has his opinion about the war. John has his, a right to his opinion. Leave him alone. And I thought, this is great. <laughs> Here you have a, a, a football player you know, coming up and defending me really on First Amendment principles. I thought it, I thought it was wonderful. But anyway, one of the one of the school clerks uh, saw me and reported it to the office. And so uh, I was called into the office and the principal um, sat me down and um, he had uh, he had been in the Korean War. And he, he, he treated me with respect, really. Um, he, uh, he was somewhat paternalizing, but in, in a good sense, fatherly. And he was thinking that um, maybe I'd been listening to the wrong people about the war. Um, perhaps I didn't understand the responsibility of the citizens to support the government uh, at a time of war. And basically, I tried to convince him that the war was wrong uh, and, and that it was right that I should be able to wear the armband. But they had already made the decision. The, the principals in Des Moines had already made that decision. So at the end of a long period, maybe 45 minutes, he said, well, I'm going to ask you to take off the armband and go back to class. And if you do... Uh, nothing more will come of it. There won't be any record in your file about it or anything like that. And he said, but I don't think you're going to take it off, are you? And I, I said, no, I'm not. Uh, he said, well, then I'll call your father and have him come and get you. And that's that's what happened. Um, but later, years later, I was thinking about that conversation. And first off, the respect that he treated me with, even though he disagreed with me about the war, I thought it was uh, outstanding and exemplary of how how a, a teacher or a, an administrator should treat students. And second, I, I'm, I'm thinking of that last little question that he asked me. He said, uh, you know, I don't think you're going to take it off, are you? And And I realized that he, he gave me, a, you know, an ounce of courage at that moment. I, I think I wouldn't have taken it off anyway, but what I thought that was a wonderful, th a, one, a wonderful way to treat me as a student, you know, to recognize that I was doing it out of conscience. It seemed like he was really respectful of your choices, which is really what the Tinker of Des Moines case is about. 
It's about respecting the autonomy and the individuality and the and the 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 plurality of American young people. That there is a multitude of opinions, and we all have to live in society together. And and what are the limits of that expression? Is a really tense conversation that is ongoing. Um, yeah, and I, I think the other piece of that too, John, it, that you mentioned, I think it's really powerful that people listen. Even people who didn't necessarily agree with your opinion, that you mm -hmm. were expressing your opinion was a way, and they treated that with respect, whether they agreed or disagreed. And I think that listening piece is incumbent upon all of us in a world that's inhabited by free speech. Speech comes in lots of different forms, and the more it it it, it can be a very productive thing to listen. I think that's something that that's worth yeah. taking. Yeah. If I could just add to that, that we think of uh, free speech as what we can say, but I think we should also think of it as what we can listen to, because the the courage that we need as a a free people in a democratic society, we need the courage to say what we think, but we also need the respect for other people that comes from hearing things that you disagree with. And for instance, when, when, uh, when we did uh, get a lawyer, our lawyer had us come up to be interviewed so he could understand what was going on. And our lawyer actually supported the war in Vietnam. And, and I remember trying to convince him that the war was wrong, but I, I think I gained some respect in his eyes at that point, too. But anyway, my point here is that free speech has two sides. There's a, a speaking side and there's a listening side. And, and having that First Amendment gives students uh, both experiences and, and to 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 recognize how to listen to what you disagree with, even strongly disagree with, but still afford respect to that fellow citizen, really, to say what they think. I think it's a big part of the First Amendment. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So, so the long, the, as a classroom teacher and as many of the teachers listening, um, we, be able to hear questions on fortunate issue with the Q&A. Um, so what we're going to ask you to do, if, if you could tweet your questions to us or share them to our Facebook page if you don't have Twitter, um, and that would be great. So just tag the Bill of Rights Institute in either your Facebook or your Twitter, and we'll make sure we get those questions answered. In the meantime, I want to pivot to talking about what classroom teachers do um, with Tinker v. Des Moines. So as you know, this was a landmark case um, the Bill of Rights Institute has, a, has a, a number of different resources that I threw on the ground, um, one of which is our Supreme Court DBQ resource. And in that resource, we have an entire section called uh, Students and the Constitution. And the very, first, uh, the very first lesson and the opening essay is all about the Tinker Des Moines case. And then the subsequent, subsequent student free speech cases like Hazelwood versus Kuhlmeier. What's fascinating about Hazelwood v. Kuhlmeier, which is the Student Newspaper Act, uh, the student case where um, students wanted to publish something in a newspaper, it went all the way to the Supreme Court, and they actually sided with the school, was the dissenting opinion quoted Tinker, Tinker v. Des Moines. And I just wanted to read this because I think it's a wonderful encapsulation of, of kind of where we are um, with student free speech. So again, this is the dissenting opinion in Hazelwood versus Kuhlmeier, which was 1988. And he said, Tinker teaches us that the state's, state educator's undeniable mandate to inculcate moral and political values is not a general warrant to act with thought police, stifling discussion of all but state approved topics. The case before us, Hazelwood v. Kuhlmeier, illustrates how readily school officials and courts can camouflage viewpoint discrimination as the mere protection of students from sensitive topics. And so something that the Bill of Rights Institute does um, is try and help teachers with resources that allow them to discuss cult topics in their classrooms. Um, and I wanted to talk to you a little bit about, you've been on the road now for 50 years. 
talking about Tinker. What are some things that you have worked with teachers and students on? How have you introduced this topic? What is your advice to our teachers? Well, <clears throat> the, in, in the educational environment, I, I think all teachers understand that their, um, their charges, the students, are being prepared to be participants in a democratic society. And that that's, that's probably the number one thing uh, that, that our case applies to. And to, I, I think there, there's a natural tendency, especially in, in uh, previous times, for the school administrators to think that their job is to, to maintain order and, and discipline and decorum. And those are all important in the ed educational environment. But they, um, they can tend to suppress the, the students' um, exercise, and, and I, I use that word advisedly, exercise of their rights. And schools are different all over the country. Different schools are different. Um, I, was, I was involved in a community discussion in Sissonville, West Virginia, and uh, the... Uh, the gym teacher was also the ROTC, the junior ROTC instructor. And at the community meeting at the public library uh, one evening, uh, he, he was there and, and his uh, students were there in uniform. And his daughter was one of his students. And we, we had gone around in a big circle. We had our chairs in a circle facing in and each person said what they thought. And his daughter said, well, I believe in I believe in freedom of speech and all of that, but not when you're in school. The school is owned by the government. When you're in school, you have a duty to to say what the government thinks. And I was just shocked. I was totally shocked by by that opinion. But that's just one side. There are other schools where the students and the administration are very much interested in uh, in letting their students know what their rights are and helping their students uh, get the experience of of expressing their rights their their thoughts and so it's a broad spectrum uh it, it's all over the place and it's there are all kinds of issues that come up um i think that's one of the strengths in our in our case uh, we um we were anti-war activists protesters you could say and and uh, we were seen as leftists, although I don't think that anti-war means that you're leftist. But uh, there are also, for instance, religious fundamentalists that uh, strongly agree with our case because it gives them access to the classrooms after school, just like the Boy Scouts might have. In fact, I, I was uh, I was at the Supreme Court building uh, in Washington for an evening lecture series uh, that they had. And, and that particular night, the, uh, the lecture was on our case. And it was sponsored by uh, Samuel Alito. The Justice Samuel Alito was the, the official sponsor of the event so that it could be held at that building. And afterward, I, I talked to, to Samuel Alito and I reminded him that during uh, his nomination hearing, he had been asked about our case, and he said, well, he, he considered it stare decisis, already decided case law. I, I reminded him of that that evening, and he said, yes, that, that he hopes that our case prevails for a long time. And so the support for our case is coming from all over the political spectrum, and that's very heartening to me. Yeah, that's great. Uh, and again, uh, anyone out there who's watching, if you have questions, please tweet at ERI, um, hashtag 10th period. Um, should get us your questions. Um, but I think that's really great, John. And, and you know, it makes me think about the work um, that we do here at the Institute. Uh, Rachel mentioned our resources. All the resources are linked here on the webinar. So um, there's a resources tab. If you take a look. Um, Supreme Court DBQs has been all digitized, so it's available for download for free. I yeah. forgot to mention that. Yeah, uh, we don't actually sell these books anymore. They look nothing like this. <laughs> They're all free for you on the internet, which is even better. Uh, that's right, and, and it makes me think too, you know, uh, as I mentioned, the community and conversations are things that we think a lot about here at the Institute. We think that 
think the, the source of a good community begins you know, is fostered by open, honest conversations. If you can't talk to each other, you can't build good communities. Um, and so, Rachel, I know one of the activities that we do as part of our My Impact Challenge curriculum um, is, is helping to build those communities um, in a classroom. And so I wondered if you could just mention a couple of the tactics that yeah. sometimes we think about employing that can help facilitate open and honest conversation in the classroom. Because I think we all grapple with the same tension that you know, was grappled with in John's case, which is how do you have an honest conversation that's not disruptive to what's happening in the classroom? We're here to learn. We're here to uh, get an education. We're here to um, you know, find out more about ourselves and each other. Um, and sometimes that takes a little bit of control. You've got to kind of mitigate for a lot of factors. Well, you have to think about the culture you're in, right? right? And so I think, so one of the things that I loved about my classroom is that it is a micro society. It's a micro community um, that often mirrors the greater community within within which you are situated. And so um, I've had, I've been blessed to be able to um, teach in a multi, multiple different environments. I taught in uh, Austin, Texas, Indiana, Guatemala. And in each of those cases, it's really about creating an environment that John basically had in order to, to, to be the person that he became. It's creating an environment of trust and respect um, with a deep sense of affection for the other. So the idea that 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 that, that football player is the perfect example um, mm -hmm. of how you how you help create culture, that all of us have something beyond our mere opinion that, that bind us together. We are all a member of our community. And so how do we help each other um, mitigate our differences in the classroom is the same is the same question of how we do it out in society. So one of the things we think a lot here at the Bill of Rights Institute is how do we create, uh, how do we help foster citizenship? Um, well, citizenship is a respect for the First Amendment and so how do you do that? Well, you have to have little practices, right? So I, I, I call them low stakes. So in order to help create that community, how do you have a low stakes conversation? Batman versus Superman or watermelon versus cantaloupe or something that doesn't, I, those are two terrible oh. uh, uh, examples, but something that doesn't have any stakes attached in order to help them uh. practice the virtues of dialogue. And then you build up from there. And you build up with sentences or with quotes from Bartlett's quotations, which is a phenomenal resource. If you don't have a copy of that, there are a couple of really great little quotation compendiums from the 18th century and 19th century that are great to just thumb through. You know, in modernity, some of the quotes may not, you know, you always check your sources, but <laughs> um, the, using those quotes to, to help students think through interesting ideas, again, low stakes, then works those muscles to being higher and higher stakes um, until they feel they until they can do what John did or what the player did and presence towards 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 this kind of virtuous conscience driven driven activity. Yeah, and that you know kind of makes me think of another question we have for you, John. Uh, if you could, if you could travel back in time and uh, and talk with uh, fifteen year old John Tinker as he's about to walk out the door um, that day with an armband, what advice would you have for yourself? What what kinds of things do you think you would would whisper in your ear that day? Mm -hmm. Well, this is this is similar to a to a question that I am often asked: uh, Do I have regrets? And uh, my standard rather flippant <laughs> to that was that you know everything worked out well I, i'm not sure i'd want to change change anything uh th there are some details like uh the day of the supreme court hearing i uh i took a, a red eye out of uh cedar rapids iowa and I, the plane, the flight was at 11 p.m. and I, I arrived early and I was sitting down with everybody in the uh, in the terminal right next to the gate. Uh, and then I woke up and everybody was gone but me. So I, you know, it's really trivial little issues. Don't don't fall asleep at the terminal. Uh, later, I had all of my armband memorabilia in a 
in a box uh, that I had uh, left. Uh, I had used the landlord's uh, van to to move, and uh, I'd left it in the van, and the landlord uh, took it to the dump. So I'd say, uh, you know, keep track of your armband. And I, I also, my father was uh, a Quaker uh, host at the Paris Peace Talks. Uh, uh, he was. He had the hosp He ran the hospitality house for a while for the Quakers, and and so he spoke to all sides of that conflict. And and I had uh, memorabilia from from the North Vietnamese representatives, and that all uh, perished in that box that got taken to the dump. But just minor, trivial things like that. I, I honestly think that um, the rest of it all kind of went well. I. Uh, I people who have read the story will know that I didn't wear the armband the first day. I I tried to get on the phone. I, I was a newspaper delivery boy, and and I uh, I was well. I, I was delivering newspapers that morning that we were supposed to wear the armbands, and and I uh, I remembered from some uh, nonviolence training that I had taken earlier uh, over. Uh, it was earlier, and uh, I'd remember that the, the participants should be on board and in, in agreement with how they're going to deal with adversity. And so I thought, well, we haven't done that since we found out that the principals had banned the wearing of the armband. So I thought, I'd better get on the phone and call people, and let's put this off until we have a chance to, to talk to each other about it so we know what we're going to do. Well, my sister, Mary Beth, had already gone to school. So... Anyway, I got on the phone, and, and a number of us then didn't wear armbands that day. And when Mary Beth and Chris Eckhart got kicked out of school, we had a meeting that afternoon. We tried to call the school board president. He didn't want to talk to us, and the rest of us then decided to go ahead and wear the armbands the next day. Well, it's put it in a position of, like, uh, the, the society wants to see the narrative in terms of uh, protagonists and heroes and, and so on. And my view of, of the whole situation was not like that. It was more like there was a there was a movement that was a peace movement that I was part of. And, and we were wearing armbands as a part of that movement. But uh, anyway, uh, my sister, Mary Bath, who does wonderful things talking to schools, she's kind of been put forward. Uh, however, I, our lawyer um, put me first in the title of the case. So I, I think that that was uh, partly because of that hesitancy to just kind of um, rush into it and to be more deliberative about what we were doing. But that doesn't play so well with the with the narrative, but still, I'm I'm glad that it happened that way because I I think that uh, I think it it helped to make our case stronger and and uh, as I started out to say, I, I really would be hesitant to change anything like like in Star Trek, the Prime Directive, don't try to change the past. <laughs> uh, it's yeah. like yeah. But but That's now great. to get back yeah. to the very first thing I said about regret, I think that it is that regret is a very valid emotion to have. I just don't have any regrets about this particular situation. Well, we're glad to hear that. And the questions are coming in on Twitter and Facebook. So let's let's transition over to some of these questions. Um, one of them was recently. So this is getting into the recent long arm, and there are a couple of questions about how. How do you see student rights being more restricted or more extended now versus when you were in school? And specifically asking about the walkout against gun violence that happened last year. So many have praised the student activism there, but others have criticized it because it was so sanctioned by the schools. Um, mm -hmm. Do protests have to be disruptive? Do stage protests carry less weight than, fun, than, than truly student-driven ones? Um, but really, the question is, how do you see student rights and student activism now versus when you were? Well, I'm. I'm. I, I know that my sister Mary Beth actually uh, spoke and said Marjorie Douglas uh, at the high school where the shooting happened. 
before mm -hmm. it happened. And, um, and so those students, uh, Emma Gonzalez and, and David Hogg and the rest of those students were aware of their First Amendment rights. And I'm very oh. proud and happy that they did have those rights. And I'm proud of them for caring enough about their issue to, to do something about it. Now, taking a look at how the school systems responded to those student protests around that incident, some totally suppressed it, and, and the, the, the school authorities had the right through our case, actually, through our de the decision in our case, gave the school authorities the right to, to suppress the disruptive demonstrations. But other mm -hmm. school administrators thought, no, this is a traumatic event that students have experienced, and let's work with it. And, and they permitted their students to disrupt, as it were, the educational environment, although it's more like an educational opportunity to, to take advantage of if you look at it from that point of view. So again, there was just this um, broad spectrum of responses that the administrations had toward the student protests and walkouts around that. Uh, my my main uh, point would be to uh, pride in the students for caring about an issue and and doing what they thought they had to do to to address the issue. Thank you. Um, so we have a student. It looks like this is a student. Her name is Alexis. And a few excellent questions on our Twitter feed. Um, she's asking about whether or not you think it was worth it. Um, and. She's looking for advice for how she could go against, um, to, to, to stand up for her right uh, to host a political affairs club at her school that the administration is not allowing them to, to have. This is Alexis? Yes. Excellent, Alexis. I'm all for it. Um, <laughs> what, was it worth it? it in a sense, uh, the, the cost to me was really pretty minimal. Um, it was the anxiety that I carried around with me as I wore the armband. And, and that was about the total of the cost to me. We, we were trying to raise awareness about the war in Vietnam and everything that happened served to increase the awareness about the war in Vietnam. The, the newspaper, whether people were for us or against us, uh, it increased the discussion about the war. And so it was win, 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 win in a lot of ways. So that I was, you know, we were disappointed to lose at the federal district court. I, I thought in each case, I thought we would win because surely the courts will, will validate our First Amendment rights. Um, but the, the cost to me has really been minimal. Uh, a lot of people pay a lot higher price for saying what they think than, than I paid. Um, what my advice to students is think about what you're doing, really think it through, and be sure that you're on the right side as you see it. Uh, don't, don't just fly into something on an impulse. Think it through because if there are gonna be adversaries you're going to have to you're going to have to defend your position, and so think it through. Uh, be be respectful of other people's rights because if if you're not, that's going to be a major strike against you. Like we we I, I described I, I dressed in formal clothes. I didn't today. I'm sorry, but uh, I well, I see you're not wearing a tie either, Kirk. Um, and you, <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, yeah. be respectful, be respectful of, 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 uh, of the situation. Um, it was Our protest was a silent protest. We didn't disrupt the schools, and everybody knew what we, what we were saying. Uh, when we went back to school without the armbands on, um, I wore all black for the whole rest of the school year, and everybody knew what that meant. And it, 
it, I wasn't really in people's space about it, but I carried my message with me all the time. I was invited by teachers then to talk to their classes about the war and, and about our protests too, but also just about the war in general. So uh, your current events or civic events uh, uh, group, it sounds like an excellent idea and uh, it would be very hard for me to understand how any administration could be opposed to that. Um, so we have one last question that kind of ties a few things together um, and we're coming up to our hour, which is sad. I'm sure we could go on longer, but. Throughout the conversation and, and a couple of the questions here, talk about the coalition that you had to build around your ideas. Um, you mentioned that the ACLU was supporting some of the appeals, the appeal process, is that correct? That is correct. Uh, the, the Iowa Civil Liberties Union uh, originally uh, offered to help us with the case. Um, we contacted them right away actually and, and that's where we got the advice to go back to school without the armbands so that there wouldn't be truancy involved and and to bring the suit at the federal um at the federal court we we got a call from a, a lawyer named william uh Kunstler, who had been uh well actually later was the attorney for the chicago seven the abby hoffman and jerry rubin and so on at, at chicago around the 1968 uh, Democratic Convention riots, the, what they call the police riots. But anyway, this was before that. He called us and offered to represent us pro bono. And uh, my parents asked around and, and people said, no, he's too radical. So uh, anyway, the Iowa Civil Liberties Union, now it's the ACLU-Iowa, uh, they, a woman named Louise Nown, a very strong proponent of uh, First Amendment rights and women's rights at the time in Iowa, uh, she had inherited a fortune. She was a philanthropist, and she offered to uh, to pay our expenses. And so um, that that kind of came to us. It, uh, people saw it as a, a good case and and something they wanted to be part of. Earlier, getting talking students into like, for instance, we went to the Unitarian Youth Group and and uh, persuaded them to to get on board with the wearing of the armbands, and that was a, that was a good experience and a successful experience. But um, mostly, the the peace movement itself uh, was there for me. It I I grew up in it and. Uh, and identified very strongly with it at the time. And it had been organized by people my parents' age and, and my parents. And so um, if, if you articulate your positions and they're thoughtful positions, you're going to find that you have allies. And if you can get those allies in discussion with you, you're gonna form a team and you're gonna get some things done. Well, wonderful. Yeah. Thank you, John. Uh, one of the lights in our studio here are going out. So unfortunately, <laughs> I think we uh, one, have to wrap up. Yeah. One last thing. Yeah. Um, your newest endeavor is the John F. Tinker Foundation, which is how people can get in touch with you is through the new foundation. Can you tell us a little bit about the foundation as our final yeah. goodbye? Well, a teacher uh, at the university level of education law for, for the past 20 years has been inviting me to speak to his classes of teachers and administrators about the case. Uh, last year, uh, he took the lead in, uh, in incorporating this nonprofit educational foundation uh, named after me. I'm honored uh, at that. But if uh, anyone wants to contact me, John dot Tinker at johnftinkerfoundation.org will get an email to me and I'd be happy to hear from you. I'd love to hear from you. That's great. And that information is included um, in John's bio um, there on the page for everyone to access. We would encourage great. you to reach out um, and ask John, um, get in touch, ask him what questions you have and, and, and get in touch with the foundation. So, um, John, thank you again for joining us. It's been a great conversation and Thank you, everyone, for listening in. We apologize for the glitch on the Q&A, but um, any follow-up questions anyone has, please feel free to email us, tweet at us, um, you know, get in touch via Facebook, um, and, and we'd be happy to answer those questions and, and forward them on to John as well. And uh, 
thank you again. It was a great conversation, John, and thank you for everything you've done for free speech. We really appreciate it. Thank so, you, John. Well, thank you for having me on. It's been a pleasure. I appreciate it. Thank you very much. Thanks so much. Um, and uh, we'll see everyone again in a couple weeks, weeks here on 10th <laughs> period. So thank you again. Bye. Thanks for everyone who, who, who participated.